Okay, well, thanks for the opportunity to, to speak here. It's very nice to visit Florence again and uh, to be here for the first time. Uh, so I was going to give, because the, the audience I think is very mixed, um, I decided to give a fairly general talk with a, a summary of uh, various results from the past few years. And I'd be happy to talk to any of you about any details uh, during the week, um, but also feel free to ask questions if you like to uh, have more details for some of this. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, something which is motivated by developments in the field of quantum gravity and, and the ADS-CFT correspondence. Um, and so, as, as many of you know, in, in recent years, um, in, in this approach to defining quantum gravity by using conformal field theories, um, where the gravitational physics somehow emerges from the physics of strongly coupled CFTs, uh, recently people have been realizing that by looking at the CFT from the point of view of quantum information theory, asking about how various subsystems are entangled with other things, um, these kinds of questions in conformal field theory give, seem to give a more direct uh, window into the, say, the geometry of space-time that would be encoded in CFT states and, uh, and the gravitational physics there. And so um, the point of this talk is going to be to show you Actually, without assuming anything about string theory or ADS-CFT, just directly we'll just talk about things that you can calculate in conformal field theories um, and see that certain geometrical calculations will reproduce those things. Um, so we, we can sort of see directly that asking questions about entanglement in CFTs, you're led naturally to start thinking about interesting geometries and even uh, end up deriving gravitational equations as just being relevant to uh, entanglement physics. Okay. Um, okay, so most of this slide I don't, I don't need to talk about for this audience. Um, I'll just specifically mention the quantum information quantities that I'll be talking about in the talk. Um, so our system is going to it's going to be a conformal field theory. I'll be talking about subsystems of that conformal field theory, so just spatial subsystems. And so we'll be interested in, for various states of the conformal field theory, we'll, we'll be interested in the entanglement entropy of subsystems. And then in part of the talk, I'll also be talking about uh, relative entropy. So, so I'll be thinking about, say, uh, some excited state of a conformal field theory versus the vacuum state. And then I'll be interested in this quantity that compares the density matrix for some subsystem A in the excited state to the density matrix for the same region in the vacuum state. Okay. So that, that relative entropy will come up in the talk. Okay. Um, so we'll be interested in in these quantities, um, so we'll, we'll vary the state of the CFT, and then we'll be calculating these guys. Uh, normally, in our case, this region A will actually be a, a ball-shaped region for region reasons that I'll explain. Um, and the point is that if you, if you just calculate these things, um, the answers to those questions suggest, or at least if you look, look at those answers hard enough, they suggest um, that there's some related geometrical system, and even more specifically, these geometries that kind of emerge seem to be ones that uh, would come out of solving gravitational equations. Okay. Um, so let me start with a simple situation. We're going to talk about the vacuum state of uh, conformal field theory in D dimensions. And so there's a statement that if you look at the entanglement entropy for any ball-shaped region, in any frame of reference. Okay. Um, so this is something that we can compute in the CFT. Now it's generally divergent, um, but there are, there are finite quantities that you can extract from this. So a famous example is where you have uh, just a one plus one dimensional CFT. You look at the entanglement entropy of, of an interval. So a one dimensional ball is just an interval. And then 
the universal result for that is the central charge divided by 3 times log of L over epsilon, where epsilon is some cutoff parameter. Okay, so that's divergent. But then I could do something like taking the derivative with respect to the size of the region, and then that makes the cutoff dependence go away. So you can do similar things in, in higher dimensions as well. Um, so there's some finite universal quantities that I can extract from these ball-shaped entanglement entropies. Okay. Now in conformal field theories, um, in in D dimensions, what happens is that the answer is actually, so, so all these quantities that I compute from ball-shaped entanglement entropies, the answer is the same in all CFTs up to one overall parameter. Okay, so, so in, in a 2D CFT, that's just the central charge parameter. In higher dimensions, there's some, some parameter that I, I think I'm, I'm calling A star um, that, uh, that governs governs this thing, so the answer in, y you know, if I want to go from one CFT to another, the most I would have to do is just multiply by this overall scaling factor. Okay. Um, so the, sta the first statement of relating this to some gravitational system is that um, the answer for all of these ball-shaped entanglement entropies is the same as the answer to a geometry question. Um, and the geometry question is that you consider a certain space-time. This is anti de Sitter space. Um, so spatial geometry of this thing is just negative const, uh, space of constant negative curvature, hyperbolic space. Um, but then there's also some there's also some time dependence. Uh, so so the um, so it's sorry the the um, Proper time also depends on where you are. Um, so this this space time has a boundary, and uh, so if I'm interested in, let's say, I have a CFT and I'm interested in um, the entanglement entropy of this ball, then the idea is that the boundary geometry of this this space time is the same as uh, the geometry on which the CFT lives. And then I just look at the corresponding ball on the boundary of this space-time and then there's some surface in the geometry here that uh, is homologous to that boundary region uh, or some family of surfaces you find the one that has the the um, minimal area or generally extremizes the area functional and then the area of that thing in this geometry um, matches the entanglement entropy here. Okay, so the statement is that I can always find some, such a geometry. The only parameter that I have to tune is the overall curvature scale of that geometry, and that parameter corresponds to this parameter in the CFT. So for any CFT I choose, um, then based on this parameter, I can choose this curvature, this, this parameter which controls the curvature of the geometry, and then once I've fixed that, um, if I want to know the answer to the entanglement entropy for any ball, then I just compute the area of that surface for the corresponding ball. Okay, so so th you could just say that this geometry summarizes all the information about the ball-shaped entanglement entropies. Yes. Yeah. So people have looked at that question in in some detail in recent years. So it, so it's a little bit uh, confusing at first because the Hilbert space doesn't factorize, but people have, have uh, uh, understood this in, in recent years, and it seems like uh, it, it is something that you can define, but you have to be a little bit careful. Um, so I won't, you know, I mean we can talk afterwards, but yeah. Um, okay, so that's uh, maybe not too exciting because, okay, probably there, there are many other questions I could I could or m many other constructions that would have the same answer to this simple question. All, all we're doing is looking at one state, the vacuum state, and asking about entanglement entropies in, in ball-shaped regions. Um, but then you can start asking about um, more general states of the CFT. So now let's imagine instead of just the vacuum state, we consider any first-order perturbation to that state. And again, I'm going to be interested in what is the entanglement entropy of an arbitrary ball-shaped region in this new state. And we could ask, well, can you, can you still summarize the answer to that question now for all possible balls by some, geom some geometry? Um, and so the answer turns out to be yes. Given, given any perturbation here, 
So we, again, start with the CFT, we start with the vacuum state, we perturb it, we imagine competing all possible ball-shaped entanglement entropies. Um, you know, before they were the same, if, if I looked at any ball uh, of a certain size, it didn't matter where the ball was because the vacuum state is translation invariant. Well, now I can have an arbitrary perturbation. Um, so now it's quite a lot of data. All of these entanglement entropies will depend on the size and position of the ball. Um, it's not obvious that you can that you're just going to be able to represent that data um, by making some perturbation to this geometry. But it turns out that uh, you can show that it is possible to find, always possible to find a perturbation of that original ADS geometry corresponding to the state where the entanglement entropies would be the same as the areas in that new geometry. Okay. Um, so it's always possible and Furthermore, uh, what you can show is that the perturbation that you need, it actually always satisfies Einstein's equations linearized about ADS. Okay. So this is just a CFT statement that for any perturbation, you can always, you can calculate all these ball entanglement entropies. And for some reason, there is this geometry, which is a perturbation of ADS space. Um, that captures all of that information, and, and that perturbation satisfies some gravitational equations. Okay. Um, so that is the story. That that is a story at linear order in perturbations around the vacuum. Um, so we can try to push that further. Um, what you know? What if what if we had some more general perturbations at at higher order? Can you, can you just keep going, can you always summarize the entanglement entropies of CFT states by some geometry? Um, and it's not too hard to convince yourself that um, there, well, there are just way more, once, once you get to general quantum states, there are just way more quantum states than geometries. Um, so it, it sounds very unlikely that I'm going to be able to, you know, for, for an arbitrary quantum state of a field theory that I could choose, um, that I could capture all of the possible entanglement entropies for that arbitrary state by some geometry, or it's, it's at least not obvious. Um, from the ADS CFT point of view, you know, in cases where we really think there's a, our CFT is actually describing some gravity theory, um, we also don't expect that arbitrary states of the conformal field theory uh, have some nice description in terms of a classical geometry. Okay, so for, for in, the, in those situations, you can have, say, two different states of your CFT that would correspond to two different classical geometries. And then you could consider the superposition of those two states. And then on the gravity side, the description is just the superposition of these two geometries. There's not a, there's not a single classical geometry that represents this. Okay, so, so in that situation, if I computed the entanglement entropies for that superposition state, I wouldn't really expect that there's a, a geometry I can find um, that, that gives me all, all of the right answers. Okay, so we have to be a little bit careful. Um, if we want to see geometry emerging from entanglement entropies of CFT states at high beyond this linear order, uh, maybe we have to be careful about what CFT states we're talking about. Okay. So we're going to motivate a certain class of CFT states, um, and then we'll look at entanglement entropies in this class of CFT states and see that that, that is um, uh, restricting to these kind of states is a way to, um, to get things that are still going to be described geometrically. OK. Um, OK, so I'm going to get back to talking about general CFTs. But in order to motivate the class of states that I want to look at in these general CFTs, uh, I want to review briefly some things about um, some standard things about ADS CFT, about uh, CFTs that we think are dual to um, gravitational theories. Okay. Um, so let me let me just start by reminding you of a particular way to represent the vacuum state of a field theory. So if you, if you start with any reference state and then act with e to the minus beta h and then take beta to infinity, then this suppresses, so if I think of this as some superposition of energy, energy eigenstates, um, in this limit, this, 
this operation suppresses all of the contributions which are not the vacuum state. Okay, so I, so I could take this limit and that defines the vacuum state. And then it's a standard um, textbook exercise to relate this to some path integral description. So you, t you take this and split it up and um, in, in, in the usual way that you derive path integrals um, from fr uh, either a partition function in field theory or transition amplitudes, uh, what this ends up giving me is some Euclidean path integral um, where, so I'm integrating, so, so let's say I want to represent the wave functional of the vacuum state and psi naught is some particular value of the fields, um, then that thing is represented by this path integral where I integrate from minus infinity up to zero and I just take the Euclidean action. Okay, so this is, and, and the boundary condition at tau equals zero is this state here. Okay, so this is, this is a path integral that describes the vacuum state of, well, pretty much any, any quantum system. In conformal field theories, um, what I can do is, so this, this is like, um, in, in my picture, the, this circle represents the space that the field theory is living on. So, so that could be, you could take that to infinity if you want, or, or for now I'm thinking about it as some compact region, like a, a sphere. Um, and so just, just for my pictures, if I, because I'm talking about CFTs, the geometry um, on this space, so the state that I get is not very sensitive to the, to the geometry on this space. I could, I could make some uh, local scaling transformation and I'm going to end up with the same state uh, if it's a conformal field theory. So I'm just drawing that whole cylinder as, as this disk where I've take, sort of mapped the point at minus infinity to the, the middle of the disk. Um, and this is just, just so I can draw the pictures. Okay, so this, is, so this disk is, is representing this path integral. Um, that's supposed to be the vacuum, and then an ADS CFT, that, that would be dual to the gravitational theory on empty ADS space. Um, and now, um, so one part of the dictionary is that if I, if I start inserting um, operators into this path integral, so I can imagine doing the same path integral, but now put an operator there. Okay, so that, that's the black dot. Um, so this is, this would be this is supposed to be some low dimension of, uh, low dimension operator, and what that would do is, for example, create some single particle in my ADS. So it's no longer the vacuum state, but if I just insert a single like single low dimension operator here, um, that would be the way to create a single particle. If I insert descendants of this, that also creates a single particle just with some different spatial wave function. Okay, so this is just um, standard ADS CFT dictionary. Um, another thing I could do is just insert that same operator, but at a different position, not at the middle of the disk, but over to the side, and then that would also create a single particle state because I could I could expand this thing out um, in in terms of these guys. If I if I just do a Taylor expansion. Um, around x equals zero, then I get a sum of these things, and so that would just be some sum of these various single particle states. Okay. And if I do the same path integral but insert two of these operators, um, that would be dual to some, some two particle state in ADS. Okay. So these are kind of quantum states adding, adding a single quantum on top of the vacuum or two quanta on top of the vacuum. Okay. But what, what we eventually want is something something like a, a state that has a good classical description. Okay, so um, the thing that I will be trying to get is something like a coherent state where instead of just adding one particle or two particles, um, what I wanna do is, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to try to exponentiate this insertion. So instead of just inserting one operator or two operators, I'm gonna imagine a state like this where into the path integral I insert the exponential um, of some constant times my operator. Okay, um, Okay. so this, if I insert this into the path integral, expanding that out, it's like the vacuum plus 
the state where I insert one operator plus the ins state where I insert two operators. So it's some particular state of the bulk theory that um, that has zero particle contributions, one particle contributions, two particle contributions, and so forth. Um, but it's precisely uh, the coming from that exponential. So um, from the from the gravity side point of view, this kind of state here uh, corresponds to this type of expression, which is exactly a coherent state now of of the bulk fields. Okay, so these coherent states are are in some sense the most classical states that if you want if you want a state that has um, that represents some classical field configuration, um, this would be a this would be a good state to consider. Okay. Um, right, and in the context of ADS CFT, um, it's actually possible to to be very explicit about this. So, so you you get to specify this this source. This is this is a function that determines the weighting for you know how much you insert. Think of the operator at different positions, x. Then this is how much uh, weighting you give to the various points. Um, and there's some explicit map you can make between those. Um, those sources, and then the, the fields that live in the space-time. Okay, so within the context of ADS-CFT, um, like this kind of state here, this path integral here, which is like our vacuum path integral, but now I've, now I've inserted this e to the minus lambda o, um, so that's like just modifying the action by this source, okay. So this kind of state within the ADS-CFT context um, is something that we think corresponds to some classical perturbation uh, around ADS. Okay, so what I want to do is just motivated by all of that, um, I'm now going to consider this type of state for a general CFT. So we're back to um, back to arbitrary CFTs. Uh, before I considered arbitrary perturbations of vacuum state to first order, now I want to consider going beyond first order perturbation theory, um, but I'm going to restrict my states to states of this form. Okay. And I want to compute the entanglement entropy. Okay. So because I have this explicit description of the state, okay, um, now I can do some fairly uh, explicit calculation of the entanglement entropy for my ball-shaped region perturbatively in this source parameter. Okay, and so one thing you'll notice is that you know this this amount of information, you know this the information that I'm using to specify my states is similar to the amount of information that I would need to specify some some bulk geometry. It's just a cl a cl like a classical field ra rather than the complete set of information to describe some general state in quantum mechanics. Okay, um, So I might hope to be able to reproduce the answer here using geometry. Okay, So I can, I can do the calculation of this thing uh, perturbatively in these sources. And actually it turns out to be convenient um, to re-express that answer in terms of one-point functions in the CFT. So you can think of doing this calculate starting with this state, calculating the entanglement entropy for a ball-shaped region, and also calculating the one-point functions of the various CFT operators for this state, and then re-expressing the first thing in terms of the second thing. So eliminating the sources. Um, right. And then, so schematically, what does this expansion look like? Um, so this is the entanglement entropy for a ball-shaped region. And this is, so this is the vacuum contribution. And then there's some, t some contribution which is first order in lambda, and it turns out that only involves the one point function of the stress energy tensor inside the ball. It's integrated uh, over the ball with some weighting function. And then the second order contributions, well, they're quadratic in the one point function of the stress energy tensor, and then also the one point function of any other um, scalar operator that we've sourced here. Okay. Yes? Yeah. Uh huh. So, 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 okay, yeah. 
Um, in what I'm describing here, we don't see that. Um, um, yeah. So let yeah. Let me let me say um, right. So the point is that. Um, I, I didn't say this before. So we don't want to. Mo it looks like looks like we're modifying the theory here. Um, so it looks like we're taking the action and then we're adding some new term. So it's like change. It's like going to the vacuum state of a new theory. Um, but what we're doing here specifically, in order to avoid changing the theory, we just want to change the state. Is that we're going to take the sources and make sure they vanish uh, at this surface t equals zero. So you you turn them off before you get to tau equals zero, and then that somehow avoids this divergence. Yeah, but that's a, that's a good question. I should have pointed out. Um, if the operator is sufficiently low dimension, then I think you can also avoid the divergence. But anyways, the main thing is that we want to turn it off. Um, so it's morally like just inserting an operator at a point, but smearing it, but don't bring the operator all the way to the uh, boundary. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Okay, so we get this answer, and one of the things about the answer is that it actually, again, is very insensitive to what CFT we're talking about. Okay, so the only information, the only place where the details of the CFT come in are, we have this coefficient here that I already talked about. So in the, in the zeroth order term, there's an overall coefficient, which is different in different CFTs. There was no other dependence in the in the first order perturbation and then here in the second order perturbation we have one more coefficient that comes this this coefficient appears in the two point function of the stress energy tensor okay and uh, apart from those two coefficients this formula is is totally universal um, and so that means that at least if we believe in ADS CFT, then we, you know, we expect that f for those holographic theories, maybe you could reproduce this answer by some gravity calculation. But since the answer is so insensitive to the actual CFT that we're looking at, um, there's, you know, hope that just for an arbitrary CFT, um, our entanglement entropy to this order uh, could be matched by some gravity calculation. Okay, and and that turns out to be true. Okay, so, um, so let me. Let me be a little bit more specific. Um, so what is the gravity calculation? So it's basically just the same thing as I was doing before. I started with the ADS. I previously told you I can add a first order perturbation to the metric, and that will reproduce the entanglement entropies to first order. And now I'm going to add some second order perturbation to the metric, and I'll be able to reproduce all the entanglement entropies um, for this class of states, um, these, these second order terms. Okay. Um, in more detail, so the second order perturbation, um, it also satisfies Einstein equations um, to second order. So, so let me, let me um, be a little bit more explicit about that. So we have, we have ADS, here's our first order perturbation, um, and then I claim you can always add the second order perturbation so that the entanglement entropies in the new geometry match with the field theory entanglement entropies. Um, and that will be true if and only if um, the second order perturbation satisfies Einstein's equations. But I have to tell you what the matter is. Okay. So the matter that you need to introduce into this auxiliary geometry that I'm talking about, um, that depends on these the one point functions of the various scalar fields that are non zero in your CFT. Um, so I didn't go into detail before, but this first order perturbation to the metric, um, I could calculate that based on the one point function of the stress energy tensor in the perturbed state. Okay. So I, so I can think of calculating that in the CFT and then using that information somehow to calculate the perturbation to the metric. Um, now I calculate the one point function of all the, any other operator that, that would have a one point function. Um, for each of those operators, I'm going to introduce some auxiliary field in this in this geometry that was computing our entanglement entropy. So, I, so if this is a scalar operator, I'm going to introduce some scalar field. Um, 
This will determine the boundary condition for that scalar field. And then I'm going to determine what the field looks like in the rest of the geometry um, by saying that it's the solution of some scalar wave equation. Okay. So I look at these one-point functions. I introduce these first-order perturbations. And then, I c and then think of this as the matter that's going to appear in Einstein's equations. So then I, I can imagine solving these Einstein's equations to find the second-order metric perturbation. And if I just do all that procedure in this auxiliary space-time and now compute the areas of surfaces, then we can show that those areas will match with the entanglement entropies in the field theory. Okay. And the interesting thing is this works, um, um, this basically works for any conformal field theory at all. Um, but there's, there's one subtlety, which is that I don't always get to use just ordinary Einstein's equations. Okay, so if, if those two parameters, oops, so if, that, if this parameter and that parameter match, um, then everything what I'm saying is true um, just, just using Einstein's equations. If they don't match, then it turns out um, to get some geometry that calculates the en entanglement entropies correctly, you need to use some one parameter generalization. Um, so, so use Einstein's equation, or use the gravitational equations that you get from the Einstein action plus some higher derivative term. Okay. Yeah. Um, we specifically, we allowed stress tensor sources and scalar sources, but I'm sure it works for, if you want gauge fields as well. Yeah, you would, right, if you had, if you had some current, then you'd have some vector fields in the bulk as well, and, and I think that would contribute to the stress energy tensor. But in our explicit calculations, we just included um, scalar sources and metric sources for the stress tensor. Okay. Um, Okay, so the summary is that even to second order, what, when, I look at, when I look at these states in the CFT um, defined in this way, then the entanglement entropy of this class of states and, and sort of general CFTs, you can actually summarize all of that information by this specific detailed gra uh, uh, geometrical calculation that just looks like you're doing gravity and solving Einstein's equations. Um, in around some ADS spacetime, okay. So, um, so, so you you see gravity emerging. Let me give you a little bit of intuition. Like, why is why is this? How is this um, CFT calculation somehow seeing Einstein's equations? Or, or what is the what is the physics in the CFT that is corresponding to the physics of Einstein's equations? Um, so basically, for the class of states that we're looking at, um, you know, we're able to express the entanglement entropy for ball-shaped regions ultimately in terms of the one-point functions of the operators in that theory. Okay, so for that class of states, what we've been able to do is describe some non-local quantum information theoretic quantity in terms of local data. Okay, thank you. Um, and so, so basically that, in the geometry language, uh, this local data translates to how the various fields are behaving near the boundary of our space-time. These entanglement entropies, remember, they have to do with the areas of surfaces that go into the bulk of the space-time. Okay. And so if we're able to express these guys in terms of these guys, that's like knowing how to figure out the details of the bulk of space-time from what's happening at the boundary. And that's what Einstein's equation does for you. It allows you to take some boundary conditions and then plug those into the dynamical equations and figure out what happens further in. Okay, so, so somehow this, you know, going from local data to non-local entanglement, which is what the CFT is doing for us, um, that is, that is the thing that is playing the role of Einstein's equations, which, which are giving the bulk geometry from, say, the boundary conditions of the various fields. Okay. Um, all right. Let me, let me uh, talk about some things 
So one of the things from the gravity perspective, um, if you want to you know, use ADS CFT, one of the big things is that I, it, it gives us some way to define gravity non-perturbatively. And you know, we hope that by doing that, we can learn new things about gravity, not just things we already knew. So we already kind of knew about Einstein's equations. Um, can we use something about our CFT description, some kind of quantum information, um, results to learn something that we didn't already know in gravity. Okay, so I'll mention a couple of things um, along those lines. So one of the things is that in quantum information theory, um, so I mentioned this relative entropy before, if you have one of these excited states that we're talking about versus the vacuum state, um, you can compute the relative entropy which compares this density matrix to this density matrix. And an interesting property of this in general quantum systems is that it's positive and it also increases if we if we increase the size of this region. Okay. Um, so that's actually very interesting already um, from the gravity perspective that you would have so if, if there's some gravitational system which corresponds to the the CFT we're talking about um, then it's interesting that there's a positive quantity so we we know about um, sort of globally defined positive quantities in gravitational systems. Um, there's a f famous positive energy theorem, um, say for solutions of Einstein's equations um, in asymptotically ADS spacetimes, that there's a global energy that you can define and it's always positive if you assume some, um, some properties of the matter in your gravitational theory. Um, but this is not just one positive quantity, but actually a, a whole infinite family of positive quantities. So given any state of our CFT um, and any region, then this is, this is telling us some particular, there's, there's some quantity in, in the CFT that we can calculate that's just guaranteed to be positive. Okay, so it's very interesting to ask, what is that on the gravity side? Um, and a lot of, in, you know, it's not guaranteed that that will translate to anything nice on the gravity side. Um, so, um, so it turns out that in order to be able to translate that to something simple and geometrical, um, we need to be in a situation where we actually can compute this, um, this reference density matrix. So we need to be a, in a situation where, um, at least in the vacuum state, we know more or less explicitly what this density matrix is. Um, so that makes use of I'm going to make use of this particular formula, which is just a rewriting of the definition of relative entropy. Okay, so these are vacuum subtracted. Um, okay, so one case where we know. Okay, so basically, if if I know what this is in the in the field theory, then I c then I can relate the whole thing to something on the gravity side. One case where I know what that density matrix is is when we're talking about the, a ball-shaped region. So, if you have a ball-shaped region and you're talking about the vacuum state of a CFT, then the density matrix for that, it actually takes a thermal form. Um, so rho is e to the minus some h, and the h is actually just a linear combination of the stress, tens stress energy tensor um, operators at the various points inside the region. Okay, um, so this is, this is a kind of a covariant form of that where, um, say, this is this is now a space-time picture. This is the ball-shaped region, and this is time, and this is sort of a causal diamond um, of um, associated with that ball. Um, so this is like the the past light cone of some point, and the future light cone of some point. And any for any ball, you can find these two points. Okay, and this, so this vector zeta is defined inside that whole space-time region, and then this this thing here. Um, I can I can sort of choose to integrate over any surface, okay. But but if I just choose this surface, then this is just the energy density integrated over the ball with some weighting factor, five, okay. Um, okay. So so the bottom line is um, in in this case where I'm talking about the vacuum state of a CFT in a ball-shaped region, um, then I know I know what this reference density matrix is, and then I'm going to be able to translate the relative entropy in CFT to some gravitational quantity. 
Okay, and then by the positivity of relative entropy, then I know whatever I get must be something positive in gravity. Okay, um, so what is this thing in gravity? Okay, so so here is um, you know so again this was a, sort of a diagram with time. This is now the the gravity picture where I've got the the boundary of my ADS space. Here's time. Here's here's the ball on the boundary, and then there's this diamond on the boundary. Okay, and now there's some bulk region which is naturally associated with that. Okay, so so the bulk region is just the uh, or one way to describe it is is that I take the this is the extremal surface that was computing the entanglement entropy of that region. Okay, and then this this bulk region is like the union of space-like surfaces that end on here and and somewhere at the boundary. Or you could think of it as, in the simplest cases, if, if I'm just in, in pure ADS, this region is is just you extend this light cone into the bulk and you extend that light cone into the bulk. Um, okay, so there's some, there's some bulk region which is naturally associated with my ball-shaped region. Okay, and this positive thing in the CFT it turns out that it corresponds to some energy, some gravitational energy, which is not global, but is, is sort of quasi-local. It's associated with the subsystem of the, of the gravitational system. Okay. And to, def to describe that more explicitly, what I could say is that in perturbation theory around pure ADS, um, then inside this region, there's actually a killing vector that vanishes on, on the boundary here. Um, so there's a, there's a natural time-like vector, um, and it would be natural to define some energy associated with that time-like vector, um, because you have a, you, because you have this isometry, or you have, have this symmetry. Um, and so perturbatively, that's the definition of this energy, that there's some, there's some killing vector in the region, then you just calculate the nother current associated with that symmetry. Um, but the interesting thing is that even if you have a geometry which is not close to ADS, which is just asymptotically ADS, um, then you, you can still consider this region um, that goes out to, spatially goes out to the, the extremal area surface, um, and then it's possible to, to um, give a precise definition of, a, of an energy and gravity um, so I won't go into the details of, of, of what it is in general, um, but I can, I can write down something um, and by the positivity of relative entry in CFT, um, it must be that this quantity in general relativity is positive. Okay, so that's something that hasn't been un understood previously in GR and it would be interesting to try to prove it directly. Um, and then just, uh, just to, to mention, um, there's another more general case um, that we can compute the density matrix in the vacuum state explicitly, and that is where you have a region um, which is whose boundary is just on a single light cone. So previously we had a boundary on the intersection of some past light cone and some future light cone. That was a ball-shaped region. Turns out that as long as the as long as the boundary of your region is lying on any light cone, so it could be a wavy region ending on a light cone, um, then it's possible to write the modular, uh, sorry, the, the vacuum density matrix for that region explicitly. That was done by these people. Um, and again, we can translate um, then the relative entropy in the CFT to some gravitational quantity. Um, in this case, the gravitational quantity is sort of living on, you can think of it as something like an energy which is associated with a region that's again bounded by this extremal surface but now um, now the other boundary at the ADS boundary is on on this light cone region okay um, okay so that was uh, so just to to finish um, everything I talked about so far was classical um, one of the hopes in ADS CFT was to really learn about quantum gravity stuff um, and so I'll just mention the, the current direction that some of us are, are taking is, has to do with um, you know, tr trying, to, 
trying to look at situations where um, quantum effects in the bulk would be important. So I mentioned earlier that the, the class of states, sorry, I'll, I'll just be quick. The class of states that we looked at earlier were these path integral states with this source here and, and not this term. And I said, well, those corresponded to states that were like coherent states of bulk fields. Um, and for coherent states of, uh, of uh, field theory, at least in the free field limit, um, those are s another way to talk about those states is that they have the same entanglement structure as the vacuum state. Okay, so the, somehow the bulk entanglement structure is pretty boring for the, the class of states that we looked at. Now we're, we're uh, considering a more general class of states. Um, so uh, you can ask me about this in private. Um, if you consider sources that now actually couple operators between different separated points, Okay, so this is some local operator here, this is a local operator here, and this is sort of a general bilocal source. So this is a, a new way of creating more general states in our conformal field theories. Um, on the gravity side, this kind of thing corresponds to going from coherent states to more general Gaussian states, um, like squeeze states. And so we're currently investigating it, uh, entanglement entropy of this class of states in CFTs and under, trying to understand um, what is the gravitational physics that would reproduce that. And the expectation is that there you, you will not just be able to reproduce these entanglement entropies using geometry, there should, should be some, some quantum gravity involved. Um, so you have the potential to learn, um, to learn about things in quantum gravity directly from CFT by just considering um, this more general class of states. And um, so just an example to finish, an example of one of the types of things you could imagine asking um, is, you know, say, does, does the entanglement structure, if we, ha if we have some matter in, in a gravitational system and we're interested in, well, how does that gravitate? Um, wh what is the future evolution of this matter and the space time around it? Um, you know, does that depend on, say, how this matter is entangled? If we had a similar situation where, where all of these particles were entangled with particles in some other space-time or, or in some very distant part of the space-time, um, does the gravitational physics care that, that this situation is very different from a quantum information perspective to that situation, or is it just, or is it just the same? And somehow from the CFT perspective, these two situations look very different. It's actually very difficult to see that the, the physics um, if, if you end up getting the same gravitational physics, it seems like it, it requires y you know, at least something to be understood in the CFT. It, it's almost like two different explanations for the same thing. Um, so it seems like there are many inter interesting uh, directions here, but I should stop there. Thank you very much for uh, very interesting talk. So it's time for questions. Yeah. Um, just a very simple question. So, so in order to get a black hole in the AD, ADS side, so um, you have to have a large lambda or have a, a large scaling dimension of the your of your operating yeah, so, CFT so side. You know what we've been doing here is mostly what I described is a perturbative approach, um, and so it, it would be difficult to. Well, where's my formula? Um, Right. Okay. So, yeah, we've—I mean, we've—we've we've kind of been working perturbatively in these sources here, and so the kinds of states that we're looking at correspond to ADS with, say, some relatively small um, perturbation. And I mean, in some cases, those could form black holes. But to get a to get a large black hole, um, you usually need to do something a little bit more dramatic. So one way is just to insert an operator of a very large dimension that scales like the central charge. Um, or you can consider uh, a path integral, which, uh, you, know, you know, if you have a path integral, um, one construction is you have two CFTs and then some path integral that instead of constructing the vacuum state of the two CFTs, you could join this Euclidean path integral into a, in, into a tube that, and, and, and that path integral will produce a state which is like a black hole. Um, or, or, or a thermal state of the CF of each of the CFTs, and so that would correspond to a black hole in the bulk. But um, in what we've been doing here so far, it's not um, it's not black hole physics. Well, 
Well, it's still, I, yeah, I mean, you, you, can, you can still try to study these states non-perturbatively. Um, I guess it depends on what you mean by non-perturbative. I mean, if you want to get a large black hole, then, then um, the easiest thing to do would, would be to this, this construction I mentioned where, where you have, say, two CFTs and, and then do a Euclidean path integral on an on a annulus. So we are running on top of okay. So how about if you really change the CFT by bulk perturbation? What would correspond to it on the ADS side? Anything? Uh, so if, if, you, if you actually change the parameters of the CFT. Absolutely. Yeah, so I mean it's known, um, you know, for example, I could actually, I could change the geometry where the CFT lives. Okay. And then this just, this corresponds to taking ADS, but now with a different boundary geometry. So, so, um, or if, or if I add some, um, I mean it's, you know, this is, this is part of the, ADS CFT dictionary that's that's been understood that that if I add some um, scalar operator to the CFT, then y you you can have some scalar field in in the geometry which um, which doesn't fall off close to the boundary. It actually gets gets big close to the boundary. So you, so in, in some sense, usually what happens is that um, if you actually change the theory, then in the gravity side, this changes the asymptotic behavior, it changes the boundary behavior of your gravitational physics. So you have some, something different happening in the boundary. Okay, so let us thank the speaker again.